women are dealing with hormonal drama, whether it be heavy periods, insomnia, low energy, mood swings, or anxiety and depression, and wondering what to do. In this video, I'm going to show you the five areas that you need to focus on to have healthy hormones forever. If you have not hit the subscribe button yet and the bell to be notified anytime I post new content relating to women's health, holistic health, or hormones, go ahead and do that now. I've taken hundreds of patients through what I'm going to share with you in this video through the five pillars of hormone health. So be ready and take some notes because this stuff is important. All right, let's get into it. So the number one pillar to focus on when healing your hormones, no matter what type of hormonal imbalance it is, is mindset. So we've talked a lot about cortisol, about adrenaline, about norepinephrine in this fight or flight response. So when we think about hormones, we want to think about it as a pyramid. So this very bottom layer of hormones is going to be adrenaline, insulin, and cortisol. So when we think about our mindset, we really, what we're trying to do is balance our cortisol and adrenaline by having a healthy nervous system. So when we think about mindset, our brain has thoughts all day long, tens of thousands of them. We can barely go three seconds without a thought. And the thing is, our brain doesn't know if with these thoughts, if they're reality or they're just thoughts. And so when you live in a place of catastrophic thinking, worst case scenarios, being really revved up all the time, you're doing yourself a disservice because your brain is living through that without it actually happening. And when your brain lives through that, if it's dangerous, scary, threatening, any of those things, it's going to put on your fight or flight response, which is going to produce more cortisol, adrenaline, and norepinephrine. So when your body produces all of these stress chemicals, and the reason it's so detrimental for our stress hormones, our sex hormones, our mineral balances, inflammation, digestive health, brain health, neurotransmitters, all these different areas of our body is because it starts to deplete those other functions when stress is high. So in your body, there's two phases of life. One's called rest and digest, and one's called fight or flight. So when you're constantly in this fight or flight response, your body is produ producing so many stress hormones that it starts to really take down the function of so many other kind of more optional functions in your body. Like I mentioned, digestion, neurotransmitters, hormone production, sleep, those types of things because it's trying to make sure that your body is surviving. So moral of the story, the first place that we need to work on is stress and mindset. If you're somebody who thinks about catastrophic things, worst case scenarios, you tend to ruminate on things all the time, make sure that you go to my video, how to reduce cortisol, and that's gonna help you, give you some tips and tricks on how to change your mindset so that your body is not constantly freaked out, your brain's not constantly freaked out, and producing all of these stress chemicals which are then impacting your mineral balances, your neurotransmitters, your sex hormones, all of these things that really include are included in having healthy sex hormones. So when I talk about mindset a lot with my patients, and this also, so it includes thoughts like we just talked about, but it also includes just in general your nervous system. So I give the analogy a lot of our nervous system is constantly being shaken up all day. So whether you have work deadlines or parenting or you're driving fast, you're scarfing down food because you're overwhelmed or late, you're walking fast, you're running, all of those things, you're constantly shaking up the snow globe like, oh my gosh, there's so much to do, so many problems, so much threat, dangerous, scary stuff going on. Keep it going. So eventually, you guys, we have to set this snow globe down so that everything kind of comes down. So, so many of us, and I talked about this in a previous video about sleep, which I'll link in the description below, but so many of us expect our nervous system to just be shaken up all day long, and then we expect ourselves to go to bed and sleep soundly, and that's really not how our nervous system works. Sleep is also one of the five pillars, which I'll talk about here in a second, but we need to have time where we're having downtime, rest time, rejuvenation, relaxation. We really need to incorporate some of these principles and ideas into our life. So I know what you're thinking. A lot of you think, I don't have time. I'm busy all the time. I'm overwhelmed. I have no control over my schedule, all of those things. But I want to encourage you to take little tiny bits of time. It doesn't have to be a lot, but again, back to this mindfulness. So 
When you are walking, look at the pace. Are you giving your brain the signal that you're in danger and you've got to get out of the situation because you're walking so fast and almost running? Or are you giving your body the signal that, hey, this is nice, everything's fine, we're in a nice, relaxed type of pace, everything feels good. When you're eating, are you scarfing down your food really quick because you're busy and overwhelmed and you don't have time to sit and eat a, a mindful meal? Or are you sitting there with your plate in front of you, taking a few deep breaths, relaxing between bites, savoring your food, using your senses, those types of things. Again, these are messages of safety versus messages of danger. The same thing goes with driving. Are you pedal to the metal, driving, swerving in between cars to get where you need to go? Or are you driving the speed limit, kind of sitting back in your car, enjoying the drive a little bit? Again, make sure that even in these simple tasks that we do every single day, make sure that you're sending your body messages of safety. Hey body, we're good. No threats, dangerous, scary stuff outside here when there's not versus messages of dangers where you're constantly thinking of catastrophic thoughts, worst case scenarios, you're driving fast, walking fast, eating fast, typing ferociously for work. Those are all messages of danger that's going to increase your sex or sorry, your stress hormones and decrease your sex hormones. The other thing that I encourage you to do, if this is an issue for you, is write down, make a list of what is making your life hard right now. So what's making your life hard, make a list and do some emotional processing with that. Write down anything that comes to mind, take some deep breaths and sit with it. Then I want you to look at it and anything that you can control on that list, pick one or two things, just one or two, it doesn't need to be all of them, and find solutions to them. Go to the drawing board with your partner, go to the drawing board with your kids if they can help um, or, or change something around. If you need to purchase something to make life easier or hire something or delegate it or cross it off altogether, or set boundaries, have hard conversations. Any of these things will help your nervous system kind of come down a little bit. So again, this mindset part in stress management is way more about giving your body messages of safety versus messages of danger than it ever is about reducing your stress and, and doing like meditation and those types of things. I'm a fan of meditation. I think it's great. I think yoga is great. I think all of these stress management techniques and tips are fantastic, but I want to remind you that your stress in life is more how you're perceiving these stressors than the stressors themselves. So if you're perceiving them as dangerous and scary and hard and overwhelming and disempowering, that is how your body's going to respond. So that's pillar number one, is to calm down your nervous system. Number two is going to be nutrition. So we talk about nutrition quite a bit on this channel, um, and I did a video all about weight loss. If you wanna have that as your goal, I will link that in the description below. But in terms of just general nutrition for hormone balancing, we're not gonna talk about fat loss in this video. We're gonna talk about what foods and how to balance your hormones. So on a root level, the way your nutrition needs to be to balance your hormones is to balance blood sugar. Like I mentioned in the very beginning of this video, the very bottom layer of this pyramid is insulin, adrenaline, and cortisol. So we've talked about adrenaline and cortisol in the mindset section, and this will play a role here too, but now we need to talk about insulin. So insulin is your blood sugar hormone. When you have a lot of blood sugar in your blood, insulin comes to the rescue, mops it up, takes it out, and stores it. it either stores it as in your liver, muscles, or as fat tissue. So when insulin is constantly, or your body's constantly exposed to insulin, that is going to create more inflammation. That's gonna be a stressor from a physiological place. So it's gonna produce more cortisol as well. You're gonna have those energy highs and lows where your energy is super high because you just ate a high carbohydrate snack or meal. And then your blood sugar is gonna plummet because that insulin came in and took it all out. And then you're gonna be craving those, those carbs and sugar again. It's gonna come back up and plummet. That is going to throw off your progesterone, estrogen, testosterone, DHEA, sex hormones, all kinds of different things. So you really want to eat or focus on your nutrition, eating for blood sugar balance. So what that looks like is on your plate, I want you to have protein, fat, and fiber. Those are our three big things to focus on at each meal. So protein looks like animal protein. Um, we absorb the most from animal protein. I'm a big proponent of eating animal protein. We get all of our micronutrients like zinc, copper, B vitamins, um, several other things from animal protein. 
Um, but if you want to eat some plant protein, some good quality dairy, if you can handle dairy, that works too. But you want to aim for about 30 grams of protein if you can per meal, which some of you are going to have to work for that a little bit because protein is a definitely underutilized and underestimated macronutrient. The other thing that I want you to focus on is getting about one to two tablespoons of healthy fat. So that's gonna look like olive oil, coconut oil, nuts and seeds, nut butters, avocado, any of these good, you know, full fat dairy, any of these good quality healthy fats. Healthy fat is gonna help keep you full, it helps to balance your blood sugar, and it also helps to create cholesterol, which helps to create good, healthy hormones. Um, so make sure that you're getting in about one to two tablespoons of fat on there. And then the last thing is fiber. So fiber is also kind of an underutilized thing that we talk about, but fiber helps stabilize the blood sugar. Fiber is actually like a little capsule on the outside of your food, and so it slows the digestive process. So for example, if you have like a Skittle and you eat the Skittle, it has no fiber, no protein, no fat to it, it's just pure glucose. So you eat the Skittle, your body detects that, insulin comes in, gets that blood sugar out of your bloodstream immediately. Blood sugar spikes and then crashes. There's nothing to hold it into place. But if you eat something like um, an apple, for example, um, again, not protein or fat in there, but there is fiber on that outside or that peel. And so if you were to eat an apple, you have fiber around it. And so that fiber basically makes your blood sugar kind of chip away at it a little bit. It can't get access to that full glucose. And so it slows the digestive process down a little bit and kind of gets that glucose in a longer amount of time, which is helpful for balancing your blood sugar, keeping you fuller longer, not riding those energy highs and lows. Um, all of those different things. However, even with an apple, I would recommend adding like some nut butter, nuts and seeds, some, you know, nitrate free deli turkey, something like that for a little bit more protein and fat to it as well. Um, so protein, fat, and fiber. You want to aim for about 10 grams of fiber per meal or about 25 to 30 grams per day of fiber. Fiber also helps to create good bowel movements. And bowel movements, as we talked about in the perimenopausal video a couple weeks ago, um, which I'll link in the description below too, fiber is important for your estrogen metabolizing. So if estrogen sits in your large intestine, you don't have bowel movements regularly, it's going to get reabsorbed and cause more estrogen dominant symptoms. So we really wanna make sure that we're having regular bowel movements every day and fiber can be really helpful for that. The other thing that fiber can be really helpful for is feeding your good microbiome or your good bacteria in your gut. So there's something called prebiotic fiber, um, which is in a lot of fruits and vegetables, and that's really great and helpful to feed that good microbiome. So for the nutrition section of these five pillars, that's kind of the framework that I give is protein, fat, and fiber. However, I wanna remind you that we also have to pay attention to the psychology of nutrition because so many of us have a previous history of psychology around food. Um, it's part of how nutrition works. So we know the physiological parts to it, but we also need to pay attention to our own biases and things like that. So I always encourage people to fit in little treats, glasses of wine here and there, things like that to kind of help ease the diet mindset. And again, we're not even talking about dieting necessarily, but even people who are trying to eat ultra, ultra clean, like something like the Whole30, there's a reason the Whole30 only goes on for 30 days because it's really, really difficult to maintain that. So I don't want you to get caught in the trap that you have to eat perfectly and perfectly clean and healthy 100% of the time because you don't. Um, and in fact, I feel like that will drive you to want to binge and you'll probably do worse off than just fitting in little bits of treats and good food that you want to eat um, in addition to obviously focusing on the micronutrient and macronutrient quality of your food too. The other thing that I like to talk about with nutrition is your minerals. So by eating this way, getting your fiber, fat, and protein in, you're going to be getting a lot of micronutrients through your food. Fiber should be in the form of fruits and vegetables most of the time if you can. Obviously, some grains are fine too, but try to get in that produce. That's where a lot of our micronutrients come from. The other thing, when we talk about mineral balancing, minerals are like spark plugs to our metabolic processes or all the things that happen in our body. So we want to make sure that our minerals are nice and balanced and we have copious amounts of them. So one thing that uh, when we talk about minerals that we need to focus on are sodium and potassium, magnesium and calcium. 
So we can get all of those things from foods. Magnesium's a little bit tougher to get through foods because of traditional farming practices and things like that. Our um, soils are kind of devoid of things like magnesium, but also stress depletes magnesium pretty, uh, pretty regularly uh, and at a pretty fast clip. So most of us have no shortage of stress in our life either. So when we talk about these minerals, one thing that I encourage my patients to do with water or hydration, there's a big push for everyone to be hydrated all the time, is actually to add some electrolytes to your water. So you can obviously get the fancy like noon tablets or there's all kinds of different electrolytes out there. Make sure you're not getting ones with tons of sugar in them. That's the one caveat I give. A lot of them have sucrose or um, various types of sugar as the number one ingredient. And I don't know about you, but that's not really where I want to spend my allowance for sugar throughout the day. I usually recommend getting about 25 to 30% of your um, carbohydrates from sugar. And if you're not tracking, I wouldn't worry about it that much. Just follow the framework. But I um, don't personally want to spend my sugar allowance on electrolyte tabs. So make sure that they have, there's plenty of them out there. I like noon a lot. Um, that don't have sugar, but a really simple way to do it is actually to add a little bit of sea salt um, to your water and a little bit of citrus. So some lemon juice, lime juice, something like that to your water, and you're going to be getting in tons of micronutrients that way. The last thing I'm going to say about nutrition here is something that I recommend to lots of my patients called the adrenal cocktail. And really, this is just a flood of different minerals that help your adrenal glands manage stress better, which we know helps all of your hormones. And that would be to do like a little bit of orange juice with some coconut water. So like two to four ounces of a citrus juice, like orange juice, um, about two ounces of coconut water, and about an eighth to a fourth of a teaspoon of sea salt. So kind of do it to your, if you're tracking macronutrients, do it to that, um, or taste, because I know it can be kind of salty with a fourth of a te teaspoon of sea salt. So do it to how you want to in terms of taste, but that can be a really, really beneficial way to get in a lot of micronutrients. micronutrients. Okay, I did a whole video all about sleep, but sleep is our third pillar. Sleep, you guys, is so, so important and so underestimated for what it does. When we sleep, several things happen. One of them being we produce melatonin, which is also an antioxidant, so super helpful for like taking out the trash. We also produce human growth hormone, which is anti-aging and really good for anti-aging, deep cleaning the entire body. So we really want to have as much human growth hormone as we can. Our cortisol bottoms out so we're not exposed to cortisol if we're sleeping soundly. We also go through this process called autophagy, which is again, sort of like a deep cleaning. And we wake up way more energized and refreshed, obviously, when we get good sleep. It also is really good for our blood sugar. So if you've ever noticed on nights that you don't sleep as well, you kind of wake up a lot or you have to get up really early, go to bed really late, your blood sugar is a little bit more dysregulated the next day. Maybe you're hungrier, craving more carbs and sugar, those types of things. We need to be um, sleeping so that our blood sugar gets balanced and we have more insulin sensitivity as well. I did a whole video all about sleep and sleep hygiene, so I have lots and lots of tips and tricks for you. I'm going to leave that video in the description um, on how to get good sleep, and there's lots and lots of good nuggets in that one. The fourth pillar is exercise. So, so many of us kind of wonder like, what type of exercise should we be doing? There's so many different options, whether there's HIIT training or high, in, high intensity interval training or straight cardio like running or the elliptical machine or cycling, Peloton workouts, or do we lift weights? How do we lift weights? Do we do like interval training or Tabata? So many different questions, right? And I can tell you the best answer in supporting your hormones is to do strength training. So strength training is going to increase testosterone levels, which unless you have something like PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome, a lot of women struggle with maintaining testosterone levels, usually due to stress and lack of human growth hormone. But lifting heavy weights in our big muscle groups like our hips, butt, thighs, back and shoulders and chest, that will stimulate more testosterone for you. So I definitely recommend that. More muscle tissue also increases insulin sensitivity. Um, so lots and lots of great benefits hormonally even for strength training. I generally recommend doing two to four times a week for about 30 minutes. It doesn't have to be a ton of time even. Um, and that can be really, really helpful for your hormones. I also recommend doing 
meat or non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So that's like just walking, moving, you know, moving our body about. It doesn't have to be power walks. It doesn't have to be formal workouts, anything like that. But getting in our neat exercise is helpful for caloric burn, decreasing our cortisol level, decreasing our um, insulin resistance. It's super, super helpful. So make sure if exercise is something that you want to focus on, focus on strength training a couple times a week and getting in those walks. The thing with HIT. So HIT can be beneficial. It can also increase human growth hormone, but it can also increase cortisol. So if you're feeling like you're in adrenal fatigue, which I have a whole video all about adrenal fatigue and cortisol that I'll link um, in the description below. But if you're feeling like you're really struggling with cortisol and adrenal fatigue and HIIT workouts don't make you feel very good, you have a hard time recovering from them, it's probably not the best time to do it. The other thing about HIIT training is we don't need very much of it. I have a lot of patients who do HIIT training like five, six days a week. And I, when I hear that, I always try to like wean them back a little bit because six or five or six times a week of HIIT is a lot. Most of the time we just need one to maybe two days of HIIT training. And I actually like to do, I'm a fan of doing like, um, HIIT training or like finishers at the end of strength training workouts. So doing, you know, 30 seconds on, 20 seconds rest of jump squats or push-ups or um, kettlebell swings or something like that, um, burpees, instead of using an entire workout to do HIIT training. So I think there's lots of ways to do it, but if you want to focus on something specifically, I would definitely focus on strength training first, neat exercise or walking second. And then in terms of cardio, like Peloton or like long, Peloton can be a little bit more like high interval uh, training, but um, in terms of like running long distances, things like that, if you're not in adrenal fatigue and you can handle it, that's great. Um, strength training is definitely takes precedence in my mind. It helps in so many different regards. It increases your resting metabolic rate afterwards. Cardio does not. Um, cardio can increase cortisol a lot, which is fine because it can come down. But if you're looking for your best bang for your buck, I definitely go with strength training. And then the fifth pillar of hormone health is going to be vitamins, supplements, and herbs. So these things are things to help support the process that we already have talked about. We need to do these lifestyle things first. I always tell my patients we cannot out supplement our lifestyle, nutrition, exercise, all of those things. We need to make sure that we have a lifestyle that's conducive to healthy hormones and then add in supplements. So this is not medical advice. Please work with somebody who knows what they're talking about for this, but you want to make sure that you're getting your micronutrients in and then you want to make sure that you're testing or working with someone who knows what hormonal imbalances you specifically have to get the tailored treatment that you need. I'm not the biggest fan of just overall like women's hormone balancing formulas because sometimes they have things that can actually be detrimental for you because they can make levels go up or down and sometimes that's not what we need. So I'm a fan of working with somebody who can help you with things like Vitex, Chastry Berry, Dongwe, um, Black Cohosh, DIM, Calcium D-Glucurate, um, Vitamin E. There's so, so, so many different women's health hormone um, formulas out there and herbs and vitamins and things like that. So work with somebody who is well-versed in this um, in Heal Your Hormones Masterclass, I go through all of the hormonal imbalances that you potentially could have and then give herbal recommendations for those. Um, but again, you always want to work with somebody um, or ask your provider or practitioner if those are going to be suitable for you. Okay, guys, my signature course, Heal Your Hormones Masterclass, goes over these exact five pillars. This is what the course is made of. Like I said, it goes through hormonal imbalances, teaches you a little bit more about hormones so that you understand what could be going on, teaches you what symptoms and signs to look for with each specific type of hormonal imbalance, and then gives you how to do each of these pillars in a step-by-step way that will fit your unique hormonal imbalance. So this course is on sale right now for 40% off if you go to alliedarman.com forward slash heal. Um, and like I said, it, it is just goes over all of these things with action steps. You have a Facebook group to get support with. Um, and it's such a great course. Hundreds and hundreds of women have gone through it. And most of them have said that it is truly life-changing because I've never thought of hormones 
quite in this way before and never, we, we just aren't taught about hormones really as women. So um, if you liked this video and you're interested in learning a deep dive for these five things, this is your um, chance to do that. And like I said, 40% off. If you have not hit the subscribe button yet, go ahead and do that and hit the bell to be notified anytime I post new content relating to women's health, hormones, and holistic health. If you have a friend who's struggling with hormonal imbalances, doesn't know what to do, it's going to provider and practitioner after provider and practitioner, is confused, is doing treatment that she doesn't really want to, doesn't feel comfortable with, send her this video so that she can start to realize there's a whole new world outside of some of these treatment options that we're given.